shot. <coughs> video. Chris Asa, I'm the Associate Athletic Director for External Relations at Cal Poly Pomona. I'm Alex Mazeo, I'm a Digital Content Producer for the Seattle Storm. I'm also Doppler and Harry Mouse. And I'm Kenny Dow, I'm the Senior Marketing Director at the Seattle Storm and the Head Chair and Dance Coach at the University of Washington and oversee mascots. All right, to get us kicked off here, uh, first question. What are some of the best ways to increase the presence of your mascot in the community? So, who wants to take that? Go for it. Um, yeah, so from a mascot perspective, I think there's two things that really help get your mascot or your brand out there. I think one, first and foremost, is just doing a lot of events, right? That is getting that visibility for your mascot, getting him out there, getting him connected with a lot of different uh, key partnerships or um, businesses or like firms in the community so I know we partner with Seattle Children's um, Swedish like as the storm and then Seattle Children's from Harry and we do visit there because those are big community partners uh, things like that and then the other half of that I would say is social media um, depends on the demographic you're trying to reach right so like I know a lot of the younger people in college are like on social media and that's where we've been able to gain a lot of traction with Harry is getting him a verified Twitter account and then just putting out content on Instagram and having people like see that content and then talk about it or um, basically interact and engage with it. Yeah, for the, the storm we work with our community relations department and then our corporate partnership department. Um, work with our partners getting Doppler out of the community and at their events and supporting them. So like Swedish Hospital is the biggest marquee partner for the storm. So we do a wellness tour with Doppler that gets into the hospital, seeing kids. Um, and all of that, as well as all the different types of community events that we're servicing at court, our baskets, or working with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, Doppler is our main brand presence at most of those events, especially in the WNBA when our players are out of market, um, except during the summer. Um, so Doppler is our main, our main brand focus in the off season. And then for Harry, um, at, on a college campus, we have all those different college campus events that mascot is prominent at, um, for example, this last weekend we had one of our Harrys down in Eugene for the U of O UW game, but then we also had five different community events going on this weekend, from a, a dog days run to a hospital visit to um, 
can't even remember a couple other things. But <laughs> birthday party or something else. But um, just very, you know, very visible all the time. Um, even on game day, um, our mascots are not just doing the game. We start four hours prior to the game, and then we have two different Harrys in different locations of the UW footprint, um, where one is over in like this one area doing different stuff with fans, alumni, and one is over with cheer and dance doing something else in the tailgates. Um, those fans don't know that we have two Harrys out at the same time, and they're never going to know that, but we're able to expand our footprint on game day. Well-known Disney magic trick, right? <laughs> you know, got you know, five or six different Mickey's in the, uh, in the thing. But yeah, just to kind of echo on what what these guys are saying. I'm, I I have come at this from a kind of a smaller town perspective, and you know, just getting involved, and getting your marketing and your community relations people involved with with a bunch of different organizations in the community, so that you know when these events are happening, and making it. You have to be deliberate say we want our, our mascot in this parade, we want him to or her to show up at, at this, this place at, at this time, we want to be part of this. You, you really, because in, in a lot of ways, some some of these mascots, they're not going to ask for you to be there. You, you have to you know, show it and want it and, and be there. So um, I think being delivered at, at, as far as you know, all the community events are concerned is, is very important. All right. How do you ensure quality performances from part-time or student mascots? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we start uh, selecting our mascots by holding a tryout um, on campus, and we, we do informational interview, and we do interview, and then we go through a whole chat process where they have to get in the suit, they have to do a skit, and then they react to different scenarios that we put them through during the whole tryout process. And then we're able to select based on that. So we know we're, we're at least getting some talent to work with. Um, at the University of Washington, we have five different Harrys um, to get in the suit. So our goal with all of them is to make sure they all look consistent no matter who's in the suit. So we <coughs> practice things like walking around the track together so their walk is the same, um, that their mannerisms are all the same, how they pose for a photo, how they um, react to certain situations with kids or adults that they're, everything they do is all the same. So no one can look at the difference in our mask and be like, oh, that's a total different person than he was in the last week or in the first half or second half. They might notice the height difference. Um, I'm this real one. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you guys, kind of map out size-wise. Uh, not really. Um, the suit fits. It's, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we. That would be ideal, but um, like Alex, Alex is our like for Harry. He's like our mascot. He's like the best dancer and the best, um, you know, most interactive. And so we use Alex in different scenarios, and we'll use some of our other um, mascots. But we want them to all like look and act the same. And then on the storm side, uh, Doppler is like that professional mascot. So really trying to find that real. Professional. Usually, they have that mascot background. They were a mascot in college, or for another pro team. When hiring a mascot, what are the and we'll touch us a little bit? What are the qualities that you want? So, are there anything else that I mean, we touch on a bit? We're talking about uh, quality performances from uh, uh, part-time or student mascots. Anything else that you can think of? Any? I think it's just someone finding that someone who has a constant energy all the time and um, you know they're go, 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 but they also are invested in your brand mm -hmm. and really want to expose your brand and help improve the brand of not only the mascot but of the university or organization. Um, and they're the ones also coming up with the ideas to help do that um, because the more ownership that they have in that um, persona and the personality of your mascot, the better your program is going to be. And we really started, the Harry program, we really started to develop it over the last four or five years, where Harry now has this persona and he's becoming more of a national brand. And um, we're getting more appearances of like national TV commercials and, and all that also helps with the success of the football program. Um, but we have to match the success of football with the success of our spirit and, and Harry's. Um, 
the biggest part of that. Um, is he's, a, he's like that open, he's the gate to the brand of the university. Um, so he's the most more against than anyone else. Yeah. Kind of echo on what he said there, I think, uh, one of the big things when you're looking at tryouts and things like that, you know, that ownership is, is important, but, but also, you know, you don't want somebody in the suit being timid, right? <laughs> you know, so it, you want them to go all out and, and be, be really gung ho about uh, who they are in that brand within the <clears throat> confines of what you've already established, of course, but it, you, it, it's kind of common sense, but you, you know, you sometimes get those people to try out and, <laughs> and then you're, you're like, or you're just putting a suit on and it's mimicking your personality, which may not be there, so. Those things are important. You also want to find that person who's going to push the line. Yeah. So like mascots, there's the line, and they want to be really close to both sides of it. Um, but you kind of want like our Harry to like, kind of get in trouble a little bit sometimes, <laughs> yeah. uh, but not too much trouble. Yeah. Um, I was used to be in charge of the mascot at University of Montana, Monty, who uh, former mascot there, Barry Anderson, wanted to be the Chicago Bulls mascot a couple others have gone on to be professional mascots. But one thing there, they made a Monty rule um, while we were there, that the mascots in the Big Side Conference could not go within 10 feet of the referees. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, after that rule came out, our mascot picked up a flag that the ref had thrown, wiped himself down with it, and then handed it to the ref. That was like one way over the line. Yeah, but not fly. But, um, Made really good video. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Some mascots are more huggable than others. How do you market a mascot that might be a little more scary to kids? Um, so from an in-suit perspective, again, I something that we found really helpful is levels are important. So if a kid it sees you and looks up at you and you're this big. Scary. You could be the most cutest looking mascot in the world, but if you're bigger than them and taller than them, there's a good chance they're going to be scary, particularly if they're a little shy or like, uh, <coughs> very small. And so one thing you can do that's really helpful is just drop down to their level, um, and that kind of just helps them realize, oh, you're not a threat, you're just a big fuzzball. Um, I also think enlisting the help of the parents is, is really useful. So if the parent sees you and the parent's like, oh look, it's fine, see, he's a friendly dog, or he's a friendly red ball of fur, um, and they, they kind of like reach out and touch you first, um, yeah. the kid, they mimic their parents, right? They, there's like all the psychology behind that. So if they see their parent touching the mascot and saying like, oh, it's fine, then they're more inclined to be like, this is not a threat, it's like, it's fine, mom says it's okay, or dad says it's okay, so I can go up and give it a hug. And a lot of times too, it's just staying in there, it may take like three minutes and they'll eventually warm up to you and then it's definitely just worth the time. But it doesn't happen just like right away. Sometimes you have to like hang in there and wait. And then there's also that point where you gotta know, okay, the kid's just not gonna not gonna warm up to me, it's time to like move on. So you gotta find that balance. But usually if you can hang around for like a minute or two, they'll and the parents involved as well, they'll like warm up. Yeah, and in general in the in the community, beyond the one on one interaction, um, I think with some of these scary mascots, and there's a couple of teams that come to mind when you think about these things. The, uh, was it the King Cake Baby in New Orleans? Have you guys seen that thing? Um, get on, when you leave here, just Google the King Cake Baby mascot. That's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to be the pretty the Philadelphia Flyers thing, but what those teams have done really well as they market that program is they lean into it. They're like, this is mortifying for everyone involved and <laughs> we recognize that but they they try and make it more fun and it, it, it once you see it it, it, it kind of in, in person it, it, it takes care of your uh, your inhibitions of like I'm not going over to see that thing but when, when you see that it's just a big goofy thing that, and, and they lean into it it's, it, it's, it's pretty impactful when, when you're out and, and trying to market these things. As a map, and this was touched on a little bit up to this point, but just to nail and try to tackle it specifically, does a mascot get your brand through doors of businesses or schools that your sales staff might not be able to get to? 100% for fun. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're the brand and, and you're the fun part of your whole brand. And 
um, you're not trying to sell anything as the mascot. You're just there to um, grow the brand, um, make it fun, create that touch point with people that hopefully brings them in to the stadium um, or to an event. Or you know, you make that connection. If, if Harry is making a connection with the young kid, that kid's going home, and you're like, can we go, you know, see Harry at volleyball or, or the Utah basketball game or football game or wherever? So hopefully, that's helping get people into the stadium. But um, the more you can get your brand out there in a very organic way, where it's not all sales all the time, it's it's, it's about engagement, um, creating those those memorable moments. It's a very yeah, and it, it definitely, from a sales standpoint, it helps spread down the door, right? Um, the, the car dealers are especially savvy with um, having the mascot out, um, and it, as as it relates to you know sales events and things like that, that's been my um, you know kind of wheelhouse. Whenever I'm dealing with somebody who just you want it, you want your you want to get this guy on board, but he's like, well, I, I can we get the mascot? Can we get the band? You know those kinds of things and the little ancillary things to us, but it, it it's a definite uh, it, it's a definite bonus. Uh, you know when you can get them there and then all of a sudden they see the value of your brand because you know they, our people are coming to see them and hopefully you know making a few sales of, for for them, themselves and so um, it it definitely has helped me get through the door um, on several deals that I've made. And then you can monetize that later. So yes. like, um, we charge for Harry appearances at birthday parties, appearances everywhere, and then in arena we charge. Um, if you want to, you know, you can buy a photo with Harry on the court <coughs> or on the field or with the, the cheer team. Um, you can all do that through the, the UW Athletics app. So you're monetizing based off you know, that little kid wants a photo with Harry on the field, make that experience. On the flip side of that, are you guys doing any sort of things, experiential things for donors uh, along those lines where they don't have to pay for those things, but they still get the chance of an interaction because they're... Yep, so we send we send uh, a couple of cheer and Harry up to like the, the premium mm -hmm. seats during the game, but it just interacts with them. Okay. What are some ways of sure and we talked a little about this earlier that when you have multiple errors going on at once, uh, what are some ways of ensuring quality when having multiple performers out at the same time? And specifically, at UW's case, how do you ensure that you talked about leading into selection and train them to have the same mannerisms, but how do you enforce that quality control? So, our mascots practice every week. Um, at UW, we practice on Monday nights with the cheer team. And then they kind of go off. That's when they also build all their pops for the upcoming game, or um, whatnot. But then they, we really do practice like walking together, um, and we video it and make sure that they're all look the same. And then we, we practice taking photos, or they practice coming in and interrupting cheer practice and kind of awesome. putting them yeah. through some different scenarios. So we're able to see that their mannerisms are all pretty similar. Um, but it is practice. And practice is what. Um, I think beyond practice, the other biggest key is having a really clearly defined character built out. It's like understanding who is Harry the Husky or who is Doppler. So just an example, like contrasting Harry and Doppler. So we talk about Harry as like Superman with the mischievous side. I personally think of that as like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air a little bit. And so like that's my conception of the character and that's like that's how me and some of the other Harrys have talked about it and how we approach playing that character because at the end of the day that's what you're doing. You're playing a character, you're not yourself in the suit, you are Harry or you are Doppler. Doppler is more of like this big kind of fat, like I, I think of him as like a weekend warrior type dad who like wants to go out and be super athletic and like be the hero and he's just not. He's got these big old feet and so like that's that's my two different conceptions of the character, right? So for Harry, like you're Superman, you're athletic, you have a mischievous side, you like to cause trouble, you do really cool things. Doppler, you're like trying to be cool, but you know you fall down or you miss your dunk or you, you trip over um, staircases and, and you play you play that differently. So I think if you have to communicate that across the team, it's really nice to have that like this is who Harry is, play this character as opposed to just having everyone kind of try and figure it out on their, uh, on their own. And then, yeah, having those key things like the Harry walk or like a couple sets of dance moves or whatever that are consistent that you can teach everybody on the team. 
we have our mascots have like a signature. So like Harry's always wagging his tail wherever he is. If he's standing, he's wagging his tail. If he's, you know, in a photo, wagging his tail, except for like that's kind of a Harry thing. Doppler kind of like shakes his belly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his, his belly on the and then, yeah, just making sure, speaking of signatures, that their actual signature is the same. That's another thing we practice. Um, yeah. Do mascots actually enhance the amount of attention adults who pay to your brand? Yes. Um, I, th I think so. So I, there's the old adage you're saying that, like, people don't remember what you did for them. They remember how you make them feel. And I think mascots perfectly embody that because at the end of the day, like Kenny was saying, like you're out there creating touch points, you're out there trying to give them a very personalized experience, and if you can like leave them walking away feeling happy, they're gonna remember that feeling, and the next time they see you, they're gonna be like, oh, it's Harry, like he did this thing for me, or he made me laugh, or he did this like, one of the Harrys, so this kind of goes against what I just said, but one of the Harrys um, can backflip in the suit, and the rest of us can't, but at gymnastics meets, he'll do that, and all the adults and all of the gymnasts remember that, and now they ask for like that performer by name because he can do that thing. Um, or like kids, they ask about the, the like flossing, the backpack kid dance, so you do that and they remember that, or adults, um, they'll communicate to you like something you did last time, they'll be like, I can't, every, every game there's some adult that comes up to me and is like, oh Harry! I remember you, I saw you at UCLA, do you remember me? And you're like, uh-huh, I do. So like, I think they, there's definitely that connection there, whether it's, it's kids or adults. Um, as long as you like have them walk away with a positive experience, they're going to remember that and they're going to be looking for another one of those or looking to interact with the mascot or with the brand again. I think the coolest thing uh, also is the power of social media, right? So we take a photo of Harry sitting with two kids on the edge of the Rose Bowl watching the UCLA. Washington game, put that on social, and now you see his comments, that's my kid, like, you know, all of that, so you're, you're, re you're recreating that touch point again on social, but now this dad is so proud because these kids are sitting with Harry at the edge of the Rose Bowl, watching, you know, hanging out, talking, talking game with yeah. the mascot. That's a good point, too, you can get to the parents through the kids. The world in this world of safety, how can a mascot performer show attention to children or adults without being offensive? I think that's pretty selfish. Yeah, just, 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 you know, don't. <laughs> don't come up to it. If somebody told you to go away, go away. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just being. Don't, don't touch. It's just reading the, reading the situation and yeah. knowing, um, you know, what's what's appropriate. Um, it's different for every interaction. Right. Like you're going to have some people that like Doppler's thing is like he has that tongue out so he'll like lick people, right? And there's some people where you can tell like, yeah, this will probably go over well. And there's some people where you're like, don't do it. Or like Harry, um, like if, if there's a couple, like one thing I like to do is Harry is kind of like steal one of the partners, right? And be like, put your arm around him and stuff. Some couples that you can tell that that's going to go over great with and some couples that like, isn't and so it's just about having like reading those social cues and like hiring or like bringing on someone who understands those social cues and is willing to like make that judgment in the moment um, and like Kenny said kind of like walk that line but also know how to like recover from a situation if they do like push the line a little too far um, yeah. yeah from a mascot's perspective when you discover that you push that line and go over that line, how do you recover them from that? Yeah, so again, it's very, the whole thing with mascotting is it's like, it's very situational, right? It's very improvisational, so it's unique to every situation, but I would, I would say, um, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of like an example, but I can't, I, I would say just like, your first option is you can either just like, you can leave, right? You can remove yourself from a potentially bad situation. Um, another option is you can try and like make the joke about like turn the joke on yourself as opposed to whoever you were playing it on um, and that can kind of like diffuse the situation so a little self self deprecation like never hurt um, you could move on to another person in the group or like maybe like slapstick humor it, it it's it's very like situational it's hard to give like a one size fits all answer for that but 
Can you, either of you have anything you can think of? I can't think of any examples, but... Yeah. Well, that's good. I think we're talking about situational jobs, you know, how to play it off. Um, how in depth, and we talked about this a little bit, but you know, mascot training, how in depth can mascot training be for any performer representing the team's brand? And I know, you know you've done both Doppler and Harry. You know, what is the difference in sort of level of training that you know, goes through with other Doppler versus Harry? Or talk about that. Um, Harry is more, it's like, this is the difference. Like, Harry is more of the year round. Um, at every event all the time. Um, Doppler's main play is in arena during the summer um, and then community events in the off season. So his schedule is a, is a lot less than, than the Harry's, which is we have five Harry's. Um, so for us, it's really getting the five on the same page. For Doppler, it's the same person the whole time, so it's just training one person and then able to take that moment. Do you guys do, it's probably sounds silly, you mentioned you know, watching the walk and things like that. You actually want to do film study, kind of like the football team or a basketball yeah. team does. Yeah, so yeah. we just had, we had one of our rookies um, was doing his first live again for weeks ago, so we filmed him pretty much the whole time and then went over with him, like, your arms are too out, you're too floppy, you know, you just gotta chill out. Yeah. Um, we go over that, like, you know, like in this situation, you, know, you stood with your legs together and we need to be, like, wide and Megan and Allen. So that's a kind of Yeah. Going back to uh, qualities and, and mascot hiring, I guess coachability is then helpful. And at, at UW, we go out like the Harry's just like we do with the cheer team. Like we're finally, you know, hoping to find the best of the best. But we really, that interview process, you're really able to kind of establish are these people open to constructive criticism when they take coaching? What have they, you know, what are some of the funniest war stories about mascots that you've experienced or been part of? What group about the war? Yeah, the final war. The war, uh, I think just you know, in game, uh, call, you know, colleagues you've you know, heard, through the, uh, heard through the industry. I mean, it's just. It was part of a proposal once. That was kind of cool. Okay. Yeah, it was like just on a random seat visit that was on Harry's calendar, and the dude, we didn't know it was going to be a proposal, and the dude whipped out a ring, and you're just like, oh, I hope someone's filming, like, I hope, I hope someone got this on, on video. Um, um, so what we do in the, in the Pac-12 is we have really good relationships with all of the other spirit directors and mascot programs within our conference. So uh, we usually get together with them on like we're playing them in a certain game and calling them up and being like, hey, we were thinking about doing this. Um, does Chip want to participate or does the Duck want to, would you guys help us out with this? And, and most of the time, yeah. We had an idea for um, like this upcoming game with like Colorado and Chip, uh, like earlier this season had a t-shirt gun explode down and yeah. hurt him. <laughs> so we had this idea of, um, playing the video on our Jumbotron and then presenting ship with uh, a new t-shirt gun that we would make. Um, but we ran that by them, they're like, no, let's not do that. And then, um, so we don't, right? So it's just disrespecting them. Uh, but like the last week we were in Oregon, and they're our heated rival right outside of, you know, for the fans and everything, but like the band and cheer and mascot teams all really work together to make it an entertaining atmosphere for the fans, whether they hate each other or not. We're kind of all on the same team in the sense that we're trying to entertain people. So like the Oregon Duck was like, hey, we're gonna do this thing where we're just gonna throw a football out on a fishing line and Harry just chase it. I'm like, sure, it's fine. Um, like Joe Bruin brought up a sign to yeah. me at UCLA that said, uh, like, lost puppy, help, please help him get home and like, then he tweeted, or he like tweeted it at me later, and I was like, "Oh, thanks for helping me get home, pal." Like, you know, there's even keep the take that interaction that happens on the field, and like move to social media as well. And if anyone followed the U of O U Dub thing on Twitter this last week between Harry and the Duck, they kept going back and forth, like, 
insulting each other, but they were like, um, Harry the Husky wears jorts. Right, they're playful. Like, they're things like that. Like, it's not real insults. But Oregon like, Duck only eats yellow starbursts, or, you know. Things like that. It was yeah. 24 hours of just back and forth on Twitter. But that went viral. Yahoo Sports picked it up, became a bigger thing, and, you know. But it's just working together with your counterparts. Um, Have you ever had any negative interactions? Like with other mascots or just no, in general? Just being people. Yeah, only on the road. Yeah, only on the road. Little uh, groups of little kids can be aggressive sometimes. <laughs> I don't know what it is about Pup Squad. They like to kick and they like to pull Harry's tail. Um, <laughs> you have this huge five to seven year old cheer team, it's like 102 little kids that Harry comes and visits. Yeah, they like to kick. I don't know why they like to kick. <laughs> it ends up being a mosh pit. Yeah, um, that's not even that. I, I don't know. I, li I like to say that I've, like, I've truly never really had a bad experience in suit. I only ask that because there was when I was working in the Montgomery Biscuits, they had I don't know if you've ever seen the mascot. It's called Big Mo. He's just this big. They call him a biscuit loving beast. He's got this long nose, he's just really fat. <laughs> so um, nobody was able to be the mascot <laughs> at, for this Christmas parade. They just didn't have anybody. And I was like, well, I'll do it. That's fine. You know, so I get, yeah, yeah, I'm like, it, it'll be okay. So I get in the, in the suit and I'm doing this parade. And I walk up to this group of uh, either, it was a Pop Warner football team or Cub Scouts on the parade route. And all of a sudden, I start getting kicks in my shin and then punch right in the middle. Yeah. And I, it, it, I almost lost the head because it was like I almost fell oh, over. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a big fear is losing the head. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know if any of you saw the BYU Cougar do a, yeah, a full. Like, but he recovered, right? Yeah. He played, that's a great example of just like if something goes wrong, how to play it off like perfectly. Just like cover and get to the side and people surrounded him. So it's like equally yeah. the most terrifying thing that can happen to a mascot, but also the best possible way you can ever play it yeah. off. But yeah, I got back up on the floor after that and so <laughs> Yeah, you're like, no, no, no I'm good. I'll just wave up here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the biggest thing is like in any situation, your mascot just play it off. So we've had yeah. a mascot get beer poured on him yeah. uh, by an opposing fan. Bush the Cougar got punched. Yeah. Yeah. He played that off really he well. He got punched at you, Yep. Yeah. I was very upset. Um, and it's just like those situations. It used to be in the in like early 2000s, like you'd see mascots getting by like the Oregon Duck and the Butch Cougar going on brawl basically on the sideline in like, 2003, it's on YouTube if you want to look it up. It was fun. Yeah, uh, it was not planned. Not so much anymore. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't necessarily happen anymore, mostly because of social media. Yeah. <laughs> Still almost the viral video of that stuff. All right, well that's all this we have as far as prompts for panelists, so do we have any questions from the audience? I just wanted to say, I took my, I have eight little twins, took them to their very first UW game when we sat in front row, and Harry was back and forth with them three, four times, and that's what they talked about. Oh, that's awesome. They were sitting there because they're, they're identical twins and mm -hmm. up and was playing games with them and stuff, and they end up on the jumbotron with it, and that's like their memory from that game. They that's love football, awesome. and they didn't care that, they kept coming back to that. So, that's cool. Those numbers now they want to go back because of that. Awesome. Love that. Alex, what, what's a, a reasonable time to be in the suit and be active, and then a reasonable time to, get, to be out of the suit with the head off in a room yeah. uh, to recover? So it, it, it depends. Honestly, it's different every time. So like, you, it depends on your like your performance conditioning as well as like the event. So like. There, and it's day to day too, like how well did you hydrate? So I think like reasonably you can go about, I mean you're totally fine if you can like 30 minutes in, little five minute break. Um, but it's just, so like I know when we did the Arizona basketball game, I didn't take a break that entire time because I was just so amped to be out there and just doing things. So I think what we typically do for football is we'll do um, your in suit for a half but you can take a break whenever you're not like on your way to do a seat visit or you have like a marketing thing to come up and we have a little like area and you can go in and that's on your handlers if you have handlers to kind of 
keep track of the time and keep the schedule going to make sure that, like, hey, if you're going to break, this is a good time to do it. Take what you need, get some water, get some Gatorade, and then coming and getting you when it's time to, to go do it. Um, when it's just you, it's kind of like finding those times in, in the game where you can take those breaks. So if it's like volleyball in between sets or like basketball, maybe like take like 10 minutes at the beginning of the, of the second half or like third quarter or whenever, you know, there's like a lull in the game that you kind of like go slip the head off. Um, you get more adapted, obviously, as with any sort of like training, you get more adapted to it the more you do it. So um, I, at the start of my like ma mascot career, which is an interesting sentence, um, I, could, I could maybe do like 30 minutes in the suit before I'd want to break. And then as the year progressed, particularly like right around basketball season, so you've done like all the football games, all the basketball games, I'm like, I could do the whole game if I wanted to. I'm just like breaking if I feel like thirsty. So it's you build up that tolerance. But I would say like 30 minutes in with like a five to 10 minute break is a good place to start. Um, but again, it's, it's different for every person. You get a cross country runner like in there, I'm sure they can go forever. It's, it's like a weird mix of like equal parts heat being the problem, and then depending on how big your like opening to breathe from is, sometimes you like can't get enough air. So like and that's another thing too. If you're like doing like a really active things so, like dancing, running, or sprinting, it's not a bad idea to give them a break after. So like we did the the dance with the dance team, and I immediately was like, all right, see ya. Like go take the head off and like huff and puff for a few minutes. Um, I saw them better. Um, things like that. That, I hope that answered. Absolutely, I'm sure it's different for everybody. We, we're in a really hot climate. Yeah, yeah. So I, when we did the kickoff game this year, I had to go stand in the freezer of the uh, College Football Hall of Fame because I like went. I wasn't used to the humidity, and I went. I hadn't been in soup for a while, and I went way too hard at a rally, and I tried to like walk it off like I normally do, and I went to Kenny. I'm like, I am not okay. Hey, I need to cool down. And so like, stood in the freezer, just everything like, yeah. So. Uh, just one more follow-up. Yeah. Uh, when you're, when things aren't scripted, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have we have a mascot, we have a baseball team, and so they do any promotions and things like that. But a lot of times when we're at an event, say uh, down at a park or at a company <laughs> event, mm -hmm. it's how do you stay active and engaging? Yeah. That's it, 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 it's hard. Even in a parade, when you're driving for three or four <laughs> miles, it's it's in, in a combined you know small mm -hmm. space. It's hard to say active. What do you what do you suggest? So there's a few things. I think one, like obviously trying to make an interaction with every person in the room is helpful to you. Like you have your people that are doing more receptive, but like make sure you make the rounds, right? Um, second thing is props. Like anything you can find around you can be used as a prop. And like trying to just think of like our at mascot camp, yes, there's a mascot camp. There was a um, a game that they had us do where they would just like hand us random things, be like, What is this other than a water bottle? And you'd have to be like, Oh, it's a grenade and like throw it and interact with it and do things like that. Um, it, it, so like using your environment around and um, like making things, like making objects stuff that they aren't. Um, interacting with like, if it's like a, a dinner event, like you can go and steal the food or like take someone's popcorn at a game and kind of like walk her away and look back and walk a little further and look back and walk a little further and look back. Um, and then there's also a, something to be said of like, if it's not like a game and it's just like an appearance, like you don't want to overstay your welcome. So if you have made an interaction with like everybody in that room and you've gone around like twice or three times and you're like, okay, I've kind of done everything that I can do here. Yeah, because the worst thing is to be stagnant or bored. Right. Or that's the worst. Yeah, so I mean like I, baseball game probably different because you want to be there the whole time. Um, but like if, it, I, if you're like at an appearance somewhere and you're like, okay, I've kind of talked to everybody, I've kind of use my environment, you know, I'm only supposed to be here for another like 20 minutes anyways, I'm just going to go ahead and not overstay my welcome. Um, obviously there's a fine line with that because presumably people are paying for you to be there, but if you've left a good impression, you've made a good uh, experience and like left people feeling happy, then you're probably good to get out of there. But yeah, props are huge because you can, like physical comedy, people, like simplest form of comedy, people love it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. If you have a handler with you, it's always good to find like the client that's been good to be there. Like, do you need anything else from us? Mm -hmm. What's the average cost? Uh, it depends on a, uh, an appearance. We typically charge about seven fifty per half hour, um, plus transportation expenses. 
it d depends on if it's you know, nonprofit, campus, corporate. Any other questions? When it comes to social media, and this is, you know, you've got multiple carries, you have one Doppler. So when it comes to social media like Instagram or Twitter, how involved are your players that are in suit with your actual social media presence? And I can assume that you, you don't have five Harrys running your Twitter. No, account. so we have um, we have one of them um, running uh, social for each. So, but they run it um, as they're like the character, they're still in character mm -hmm. on um, on social. So it's all about just developing them, and, and then also with social media training, etc. Um, but like uh, with the Oregon the Oregon Duck jokes this weekend, um, Alex runs our Harry account, and so he would you know. We kind of went back with a group of us, like with ideas, and like, no, that's not appropriate, or you know, that that works. Yeah, it was it was very much crowdsourced, but like I was kind of like the end filter for what actually got posted, and like because I know the brand voice really well, like I'm thinking like, would this be something can be said? And then um, similarly with Doppler, uh, it's it's kind of like it's there's only one Doppler, so I bounce my ideas off of Kenny a lot. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I know the brand voice, I know the character, so making those decisions and so like if you're in a university setting you have like a team it may not be a bad decision to just delegate either like the captain of that team or like one member of the team like you're our social media guy you do all this you're our props guy you're in charge of that you do x y and z like you're our calendar guy things like that but i put them through training first to make sure you trust them so mm -hmm. not, they still are that face of the, the yeah. university yeah. so we don't want anything there is such thing as bad press Kenny, um, yeah. what, what would be a good thing for the handlers to be doing while the mascot is at an event, not not, not at a game, but at a, a separate event? Uh, so we have our uh, handlers always video, and so we're capturing that content that we can use for either one, like for a UW, or for our nationals video um, for entry there, but it's video so we can go back and then look and see like, oh, we did this really well, we could have done this different. Um, art is being like that, also like being that person who's like, okay, the situation's getting a lot of hand. Like, these kids are going off the tail, or kind of just be there, to, like protecting, but then also helping engage as well. You never want the mascot to be the bad guy, so the handler can kind of be that individual that can step in and say like, stop, or like, I, um, when we were walking Harry around at a Mariners game I, on like college night, there were Coop fans there and they were getting really aggressive. And so just being able to like step in and like don't do that, they, you know, it's, it's a safety measure without having Harry have to get into like a bad situation. Are they like, Harry, it's time to go? <coughs> yeah. Because you don't want the mascot to be like, sorry kid, I can't take a picture, see ya. <laughs> you know, never make the mascot the bad guy. I'd like to thank the panel for your participation today. I appreciate it. It was very informative. Thank you guys for coming and attending. Obviously, we have some time left for the technical lead, so I'm sure these guys can stay around and chat. If you guys have questions for them specifically, uh, I just want to get to know them But thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be my first year's Doppler and my